Guys, we're in our study, the case files of Dr. Luke, going through the gospel according to Luke, and we are in Luke chapter 12, verse 22 this morning. I'm going to talk about the world's most acceptable sin. Luke 12, 22 says, and Jesus said to his disciples, for this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat, nor your body as to what you shall put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, and they have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubic to lifespan? If then you cannot even do a very little thing, why are you anxious about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory did not clothe themselves like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O men of little faith? And do not seek out what you shall eat and what you shall drink, and do not keep worry, keep worrying, for all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek for his kingdom, and these things shall be added to you. My dad was terrified of snakes. I mean, it, for somebody that spent all of his time in the woods and hunting and doing all these, working all the time, but he hated a snake. I remember one time we were cleaning out around a pond and the water had gotten down, so we were cutting a bunch of bushes down around it, and I caught a green snake. I mean, the thing couldn't have been 14 inches long, and I picked it up and started toward him with it, and he had an ax in his hand. Thankfully, he at least turned the ax handle around and had the blade down on this end. He says, you're my son, but I'm going to knock you in the head if you put that thing on my And he was dead serious. And I would always tell Dad, I'd say, Dad, uh, you know, the snakes, you know, they're, they're not going to hurt you. And certainly a green, I said, Dad, it's not going to hurt you. He says, yeah, but it'll make me hurt myself, okay? Make me hurt myself. That is exactly what worry does, okay? Worry you know, it's not a, a club to be hit over, that can hit you over the head, but it is a form of self-mutation, mutilation, self-mutilation of you beating yourself up. You hurt yourself when you worry. We saw last week about the folly of greed and how Jesus warned them to, to, to deal with greed in the right way. It's okay to make money, but you need to be careful with it. And Jesus talked in that section about people who had a lot or, or had, were rich in the way of the things of the world, people that were, or con, had a preoccupation with getting ahead. And today, he's going to talk about this idea of people worried about getting by. It's interesting to me that when Jesus gets to this section, he's not talking to the people anymore. It says that he said to his disciples, to us, to the believers, to the followers. Why is that? Because God knows that we struggle with this. Now, I'm not going to make you do it, but if I ask you to raise your hand, you know, are, do you ever worry about anything? See, we Christians are not immune to this. We're not immune to it because we face the same pressures that everybody else does, the same things that happen to the world happen to us, but we know we shouldn't worry, right? We, we know better. We know we have a father who cares for us, but we just can't seem to help ourselves, and we even worry then about being a worrier. The Bible says that worry is a sin. We take it way more lightly than that, don't we? We do. That's the reason I've called this probably the world's most acceptable sin. Chuck Swindoll, somebody that I really love in Living Beyond the Grind, writes this, worry is one of the socially acceptable sins in the Christian life. We would never smile at a Christian who staggered into his home night after night, drunk and abusive. But we often smile at the Christian friend who worries. We would not joke about a brother or sister in God's family who stole somebody's car but we regularly joke about worrying over some detail in life. That is so true. We, got, we give ourselves a pass on this one, and we give other people a pass because we don't want them to, to look at us and see that is a sin in our life. The Greek word for, for, for worry comes from being double-minded. 
double-minded. I don't know if you knew that, but it, you know what it really means? It, it means that our mind is torn between what is happening today and what might happen tomorrow. We are double-minded. It's the idea that she or he is fighting a battle on two fronts. That we're fighting the battles that we face today, and all of us have things that come up every day in our life, but we're also fighting about what's going to happen. And life is hard enough one day at a time, and if you fight on two fronts, you eventually are going to lose the war. The warrior attempts to live the future today. That is the idea. The future, here's what I, tell, I try to tell myself, the future isn't here and the future is not mine. The future is not here and the future is not mine. I don't own it. I can't control it. I can do things today that will influence it, but it, I don't know. Worry is a distraction. Worry is the, the painful preoccupation of the consequences of what might happen, what might happen in this situation. So today the Lord forces us, we go through this line by line, he's forcing us to think about why we are not to worry, okay? Let's begin with this, the, the disease of worry. Let's talk about how it's not good for you, okay? The disease of worry. And number one, the A one under that, is it put, that worry can be fatal. Worry can be fatal. Worry is the number one mental disorder in America. Did you know that? The Mayo Clinic tells us they claim that 80 to 85% of their total care load is about people that have worry and anxiety, that they just, they just gets in their skin and they cannot help themselves. And they say that many people, uh, that this is probably the number one health priority in America that doesn't get talked about. As a matter of fact, one leading physician that says that over 70% of the, of the patients coming to mental institutions or undergoing mental, mental counseling could be set free from that if they could get away from worry. Worry is harmful, guys. And the thing is, is that it is easy to become addicted to worry that it becomes the pattern of your life. And we laugh, don't we? We call them worry warts or worry holics. You know, they're worry holics. Oh, they just said, and we laugh at someone. It wouldn't be funny laughing at somebody that had cancer, would it? Jesus says that this is a sin. Both the Bible and medical science agree that worry is not good for you. Dr. Edward Hallowell wrote about this in, in his book. He says this, excessive worry, or what I call toxic worry, can make you sick. It can cut down your enjoyment in life, and it can hamper your productivity. Toxic worry is bad for every system in your body. It increases the risk of heart attacks and strokes. It impairs digestion. It causes shortness of breath. It causes all kinds of muscular skeletal aches and pains, and it produces headaches and migraines. He goes on to write that he never knew a man who worked himself to death, and he knew many that worried themselves to death. Worry can be fatal. Number two, worry is foolish. Worry's like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but it's not going to get you anywhere, okay? It's not going to do one thing for you. Worry is especially foolish for the Christian. It's foolishness because we forget who we are. We forget that we are children of the king, the ultimate mental doctor, somebody that we can take all of this to. It's like a woman worried about her hairdo while she's going over a boat on the Niagara Falls River. I mean, it doesn't make any sense that we are worried about things when we are being carried by God through this life. The great preacher of the 19th century, McLaren, wrote, he says, what does your anxiety do? It does not make you escape its evil, but it makes you unable to cope with evil when it comes. Isn't that right? We're, we're so, you know, third thing here, worry is futile. It's futile. It doesn't make sense. And when I say futile, I mean it is useless. It is pointless. It is fruitless. It is unsuccessful. It does nothing. Jesus said that. And what, which of you, by being anxious, verse 25, can add a single cubic to his lifespan? If then you cannot even do a very little thing, why are you anxious about other matters? 
Worry cannot lengthen life, but it can certainly shorten it, okay? There are two giant things here. Number one, it can take away days of your life, but the other thing is it can rob this day of your life. We worry, and it, it gets in the way of being able to be happy today and what's going on. Edward Hubbard wrote, he said, the greatest mistake in life is that you worry that you're going to make it, that you're going to make a great mistake. Hello, we're all going to make mistakes, okay? It is futile to worry. Oswald Chambers says that, 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 that fret and worry is caused by calculating without God. I like that. You want a definition for worry? It is calculating without God. It is saying, well, you know, if this happens and this happens and that, well, all of those ifs are calculating without God's hand in your life. So we all agree it's not good for us to worry, but what do we do about it, okay? Just telling you, oh, don't worry, be happy. You know the song, don't worry. I won't sing it for you. That'll make you happy. Um, but we, we, that, that sounds... That sounds patronizing, doesn't it? Condescending almost. Oh, just be happy, you know? How do we overcome it? Well, I'm going to give you five worry busters. Let's talk about the defeat of worry. The defeat of worry. Five worry busters. These come straight from Jesus, okay? Number one, recognize that God cares for birds, flowers, and you. Recognize that God cares for birds, flowers, and you. Consider the ravens, for neither they sow nor reap, and they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. Verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow, and they neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O men of little faith? I love the way Jesus took common, simple things to give us heavenly truth. That's what we call a parable, okay? I can see him teaching. And as he gets here, looks up, there's a flock of ravens there, a flock of birds. He says, consider the birds. Look at the flowers under your feet. See, you may not understand divine providence, but you understand about flowers and birds. You can get that. And Jesus says, these birds are so valuable to God. And you don't think that you're as valuable as they are? I've been an outdoorsman and a amateur student of nature all of my life. I've never heard of a bird having an ulcer or dying from a heart attack. I, I, you know, I, I, I came across this poem. I'm a, I'm a, it's, an, it's not a poem. It's an imaginary conversation between two birds. Said the robin to the sparrow, I'd really like to know why these ancient human creatures rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, I think it must be that they have no heavenly father so it just cares for you and me. Uh-huh. Don't be a bird brain, okay? Don't be a bird. You know, Jesus spoke of the lilies of the field. He's talking about these wildflowers that popped up. I meant to put a picture. I took a great picture of Jim when we were turkey hunting the other morning. We were going through a pasture, and there were these purple flowers that had just voluntarily popped up. Just a beautiful picture in the background. We just kind of got it in there. But that's what he's talking about. They pop up and they bloom. Now, there's an important lesson here about birds and flowers, and it's not just on the shallow, so we're going to take a step there. Here's what I want to tell you. God feeds the birds, but they are hard workers. Birds are busy. You ever seen a bird? I mean, as a turkey hunter, a turkey will come up in the field. They never stop. They're always going. Why? They're hunting for that food. They're, 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 there's a wren, and I mentioned this wren. It's made the news twice now. It's made the sermon twice now. Of the wren building a nest on our porch. And that wren, that, that male and female, worked hard, got it together. But now the, the babies were born, and that mama bird would come up there with that ledge with food in her mouth, and them little birds, and open their mouth. And they would drop food in there and off again to get them something to eat and to get some more for those kids. I mean, it was a sight. All of you have seen that. Jesus says to make, he's going to make sure that you are fed. You can't be like the baby bird, though, and just sit around. There comes a time when you get kicked out of that nest. There comes a time when you got to get up and go. So birds teach us that God is taking care of them, but they teach us this important idea of diligence. Birds teach us about diligence, that we have a responsibility in this. Flowers. 
on the other hand, are beautiful, and they are totally dependent. Totally dependent. They do not prepare the soil. They don't gather their food. They get the nutrients and the moisture and the light that they need. All they can do is accept that. They, don't, they teach us about dependence, about dependence. So the lesson that Jesus is telling us, we ought to be as diligent as the birds and as dependent as the flowers. Yes, we ought to go about life, try to do things to make it better, but we all the whole time are dependent on God, trusting him. God's gonna take care of us. The flowers and the birds of God's creation, we are God's children. If he's taking care of all the creation with that kind of detail, surely he's gonna take care of you guys. A second way to bust worry in your life, defeat it, receive today as a gift and forget tomorrow's worries. I've already mentioned this, one of the great dangers of worry, what is it distracts from now? Jesus says that exact same thing in Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Somebody say, amen. Let me read that in the message translation of the Bible. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now, and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will come help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. I've heard workaholics say, well, I'm afraid something bad's going to happen in the future. Let me lighten you up. There is no need for you to worry about that because I can answer that for you. Something bad is going to happen. Something bad is going to happen in the future. And you know what? There's absolutely nothing you can do. Here's the great news. God is good every day. Every day, God is good. And he will see you, he will take care of you. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't consider future plans and plan wisely. We talked about that last week, that I don't want to take care of you when you get old. Take care of yourself, okay? But I'm telling you, we trust God along the way. Don't worry about the future. Corey Ten Boom says, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but it empties today of its strength. When you are always worried about something, you are weaker than you could be. The psalmist says, so teach us to number our days that we may be, may be present to thee a heart of wisdom, so that we may present to thee a heart of wisdom. Did you know that it didn't say to count your years? This is my anniversary, we're counting years. God says that we ought to count the days. You know what that means? Every day is a gift from God. Every single one of them. When you woke up this morning and slid your feet on the floor, it is a blessing from God. It is something that he has done. It's a precious gift. Today, today, enjoy today. I heard about a clock, a little clock. He'd been ticking for a long time, but he began to get anxious. He got to thinking about how often he was having to tick. Man, I got to tick 60 times every single minute. That's 360 times an hour. That's 8,460 times a day. That is 3,153,600 times a year. If I do that for six years, that's 15,768,000 clicks. And he just got all worked up and anxious. So he went to see the chronographic doctor, the clock doc. He says, Doc, I'm so worried. There's no way that I could... I can tick 15 million times. And the doc says, well, let's think about it. How many times can you click at a time? And he says, I can click one time at a time. He said, well, let's do that. And he clicked. And he said, let's do that again. And he clicked. He says, I think if you'll click the one time that you can, then all the rest of them will take care of themselves. So he went on home, ticking and clocking away. There used to be a Timex commercial. You, you old folks, and there's several of you in here. You remember it t- it Timex? It takes a licking and keeps on ticking. You hear the old people, right? And they would have it run over by a truck. They would have it dropped out of a building. And the guy would walk over and pick it up. Timex takes a licking. Listen to me. Life is going to throw licks at you. You're going to feel like you got ran over by a dump truck. Just tick. Just tick. Just take it this day. Reduce this down, okay? Man, today is a gift. Open it and enjoy it. A third buster of stress in your life, anxiety. Reduce anxiety by simplifying your life. 
oh, I think I'm preaching to Tim Jones. Anybody else in here? One of the reasons we are anxious in our life is because we have made it so complicated. We have so many activities and so many demands, and you know, we just, we can't do everything well, so we worry about it. And the busier you get, the more anxious you get. Think about Jesus, the parable of the sowers, and he's talking about how heart receives the soil, remember the, the seed, and how heart receives the good news of the gospel. Is he describing you? And the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones which you have heard, and they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and they bring forth no fruit to maturity. Jesus told the story last week about this entrepreneur had a bust of a, of, of a sales year. His crops were out, and he had no place to store it, so he built more things. And he says, man, he says, I'm going to enjoy this for years to come, and he did not even get to enjoy it that night. He did not live to enjoy the goodness. And Jesus made the point in that thing. He says, watch out for greed, for a man's life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. But we compare that to our, our daily experience, and that is not what our culture is telling us. I mean, every magazine that you read, every website that you go to, everything that we hear, they are always say, you gotta have this, you gotta do this. If you really wanna enjoy life, then you need to go climb this mountain or climb the face of this rock or go on this excursion or do that or that. And it blares at us from every direction. And Americans have become like the old donkey that they put the thing on and it holds the carrot out in front of them and he can see the carrot and he wants it and he takes a step toward it and he just keeps on. And Americans have gotten to that. And some of you have fallen into this trap that all you're doing is trying to get something that will never, ever be there. There is a thing to learn in this. It is a biblical principle and it is contentment. People worry because they're not content. It's the reason they jump to the next level, the next job, the next thrill, the next spouse. I came across a quote from a 14-year-old boy. I don't know his name, but he's got wisdom beyond 14. It was spring, but it was summer that I wanted, the warm days, the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall that I wanted, the colorful leaves, the cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was winter that I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but... It was spring that I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood that I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 that I wanted, to be mature, sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 that I wanted, <laughs> the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle ages that I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. My life was over, but I never got what I wanted. What are you chasing? That's why people worry. They never learn that simple principle of commitment, contentment, contentment. The Apostle Paul wrote about this in Philippians. I love his spirit. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live with prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We often quote that second part, but that first part, we can do all things through him when we're content with him. Right? You should work hard. You should be always striving in your spiritual life. You should not be content with where you are spiritually. I will tell you that. You need to be growing. You want to know more. You want to learn more. But in your normal life, are you content with what you have. Mm. Robs you of your joy, I'm telling you. The D one here, we're busting worry. What's another one? Refuse to carry your burdens alone. <laughs> we worry about our problems when we try to carry them all by ourselves. They're far too heavy for us. We need to learn how to unload our... I heard about a workaholic. I mean, he was, he was just unbearable at work. I mean, he was just a worryholic, and he was unbearable at work. I mean, people, just, I mean, he just worried about everything constantly. Well, one day he showed up to work, he was totally different. His attitude was different. His, his demeanor was different. He was happy. He was laughing. Nobody could understand it. And one of the co-workers said, man, what happened to you? You are not the person that I know. 
He says, man, he said, I hired somebody. What did you hire somebody to do? I hired somebody to worry for me. You're kidding. He said, that's a great idea. He says, yep. He says, if it pops up, I just give it to him. Let him worry about it. And it frees me up to be happy every day. He said, man, what do you pay somebody like that? $5,000 a week. The guy says, you don't make that kind of money here. How are you going to pay him? He said, ain't my worry, it's his. You know, <laughs> ain't my worry, it's his. That would be great. That's a great idea, right? To hire somebody to worry for you. Wouldn't that, isn't that great? Do you agree? God has offered to do that for free. God is begging you today to bring your birth. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. What an invitation that I could take my stuff that's weighing me down, that's heavy on me, and go and lay it before God. And God, I can't carry this. I need you. I want you to. Hey, here it is, God. And God says, well, thank goodness. I've been begging you to do that your whole life. Why you been, why you been struggling with that? Why you been dragging that around? Why don't we do that? Or we think we're being nice to God. Well, I don't want God to have to deal with it. What? God is trying if you choose to do so, today you can choose to take that thing to God and say, I can't do this anymore. You'll feel that lift. You'll feel it come off of you. But God has also given us each other. Sometimes we are to burden, share with others. And that's both ways, Okay. Sometimes we, we accept carrying the burdens of others. We want to help them out. Man, I know what you're going through here. Let me pray with you. But when it comes to us sometimes, we don't want to do that. We don't want to involve anybody else. We don't want anybody else to have to worry about us. That's not scriptural, okay? God wants you to give, you know, bear one another's burden and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2. We ought to do this. The law of Christ is for you to love your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And when you support and help your neighbor, you are being the body of Christ. One last worry buster here, okay? Realize that pleasing God is really all that matters. Verse 31, but seek for his kingdom and these things. He's talking about food and clothes and other needs, other worries shall be added to you. Part of our worry is we don't think we can live up to somebody else's expectations or we can't live up to what we think will carry us through another day or to prepare for tomorrow. We worry about, I'm going to tell you like I told you, you can't. You cannot live up to the expectations of all these people. You cannot do that. There is one thing in this life that is important. That since, since the world has been known, <laughs> okay, we are born and raised in America, so we don't understand kings and queens, but we see them on TV, right? Many of you watch stuff like that on TV. Here's the point. Every king, there have been kingdoms on and off for the whole history of mankind, and there is a common element in all of those kingdoms. Some have been good, some have been bad. Common element. You know what it is? There is a ruling head. There's a king or a queen. There is a king to have a kingdom a king to have a kingdom. And in every kingdom, if you please the king, it's better for you. Right? I'm telling you, if you want to simplify your life today, quit worrying about so much, concentrate on one thing. Don't, don't concentrate on anything else. Concentrate on this one thing. I want to please the king. I want to please King Jesus. And how do I do that? I do that by loving him, obeying him, serving him, serving others. I get involved in what he's involved in. He is a loving, caring king. And here's the great thing about our king. Is he your king? Say, my king. All right? He has both the inclination and the resources to take care of everything that you would worry about. <laughs> so don't focus on 100 different things. Focus on that one thing. 200 years from now, we're going to all be dead. You're going to be dead. And it will not matter who you pleased if you didn't please the king. A million years from now, this will be the only thing that matters. It's whether you please the king. Whew. Exhale. It's 
So some of you are thinking, well, he wouldn't be telling me not to worry if he knew what I was going through. Well, God's telling you not to worry. Well, but he's God. What's he got to worry about? Well, let me let you hear from another man, flesh and blood. A man who had been stoned three times, left for dead. He had been shipwrecked. He had been beaten several times, hunted by a relentless, vicious mob that wanted to kill him. And when we hear from him, he's sitting in a Roman prison, waiting for his head to be chopped off. And this guy says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you will refuse to worry and you will instead seek the king and his peace, he will give it to you. The world doesn't understand this kind of peace, I'm telling you. That, that inner peace that, that, that separates us from... It, 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 Paul writes later and says, it'll protect your mind. It'll keep your mind from wandering and going hither and yon. Life is too short to worry so much. Come on, right? Bishop Taylor Smith, I love this. The worried old cow would have lived till now if she'd only saved her breath. She feared her hay wouldn't last all day, and she mooed herself to death. Is that you? Are you mooing and groveling yourself to death, worried about your hay not going to live? Listen to me. Life, this life that we have, only has two handles. When you come up on something and you feel yourself falling, you can either grab on to the handle of fear and anxiety and hold on to that, or you can grab on to the handle of peace and faith and trust. Grab the right handle. Grab the right handle. Here's my advice to you, okay? You know, to don't worry, be faithful. That kind of comes up. But here's my greatest advice to you. Right now, in the quiet of your heart, why don't you go ahead and bow your eyes, okay? Bow your head and close your eyes. And that thing that is eating you alive, if, if you, and you can use your hands if you like, because I'm going to, I want you to feel yourself just saying, here, Lord. And just take that, that weight of that thing off of yourself and hand it to him. Here, Lord. Listen to me. If you're an unbeliever here today, you can't experience that fully because the greatest weight on you is the sins of your life. But guess what? Jesus came and went to the cross for that. And he says, bring no sins there. I'll take those. So if you're not saved, that is the biggest thing. You, and I would say this. You need to be worried about that. You need to be worried about that. But if you're a believer, guys, and this message has really been about us today, hand that thing away. Quit fighting it. And learn in your personal prayer time every day to hand to the Lord. Now here I'm going to offer another invitation. Come get in this altar today. And say, God, I don't want to be a worry ward. I don't want to be a worry holic. I want to live each day in the fullness and the joy and find that peace inside. So, Lord, I'm bringing you this stuff today, and I'm going to leave it with you. Father, bless us today with your spirit, with your touch. Do what only you can do. And I speak to our heart, challenge us, and I pray that we rise to that challenge. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand up, guys. We're going to sing.